I do want to give a thank you to Mike Leiter, who led worship today while the, while the staff position for worship director is open. Again, it's a trapeze moment for us at, at the church. Again, we've had our youth. They've been leading a ton. And I, I, I reached out to Mike. He is a lead pastor of a sister church in the Vineyard Movement that we're affiliated with up in Freeland, which is between Midland and Saginaw. It's about a 100-mile drive up uh, to be here. And so um, he pastors his church. Again, there are church plants, and they, their church service meets at 2.30 in the afternoon. And so Mike, right now, as I'm speaking, is in his car right now driving back up north so that he can lead worship and also preach this afternoon. And so thank you, Mike. I know you can't hear me, but uh, thank you, Mike, for leading us for your yes in leading, and it's just an example of having him here of the provision of God. And so, um, yeah, so that's it. So that's Mike. So we're, we're in this series uh, where we're looking at the life of King David. The series is called Strengthen Yourself in the Lord. And we're looking at the life of David before he was king. Here's a summary slide of what I've preached on in this series. It's a key point that David, David was rejected numerous times. He was rejected by by his king. He was rejected by his countrymen, rejected by his band of brothers, and that's in 1 Samuel chapter 16 through 30. But in the midst of particularly that final rejection, when his closest friends turned on him, here's what happened in 1 Samuel 30 verse 6, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Now it's very clear in the New King James translation as well as in the original Hebrew that God did not do this to David. God did not strengthen David. David strengthened himself. And David's life shows us when you read about the life of David in the Bible, it shows us the ability to learn how to strengthen ourselves in the Lord is a key tool on our spiritual journey to equip us in our faith. And so in this series, we've been asking, well, how did David do that? How did he strengthen himself in the Lord? And each week I've been sharing a way, an aspect of it. One thing David did when we look at the scriptures, when we look at his life, we say, yep, that's how David did it. That's another way that we can imagine David strengthening himself in that moment of his deepest betrayal from his friends. So last week, the answer I focused on was this, that one way he strengthened himself was he remembered his personal history with God. That there was strength, in remembering. There's strength in remembering. So that's one way that we can strengthen ourselves to remember. And another answer, our focus for today is this, that David praised and thanked God during the storm. And so today's sermon is called What the Enemy Meant for Evil. Now, one of my favorite books of the Bible, I love, I love God's word, is, is Psalms. Wherever, whatever you're going through in life, Psalms was the original praise and worship book of believers in God. And whatever you're going through in your life, you can find your voice in Psalms. There are Psalms of praise. There are Psalms of sadness. Psalms where the writer cries out to God. Psalms that are filled with prayer. And David, David wrote many of the Psalms. Here's one example that David wrote. Psalm 34. He says, he declares, I will bless the Lord at all times. My praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. So going back to my key thought where I said, David praised and thanked God during the storm. This psalm echoes that. Again, David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. Not just the good times, not just when everything's going great, but all times I will bless the Lord. David says that praising God will continually come out of his mouth. Continually. There is strength when we do that. Another example, here's an example, Psalm 22, where David practiced what he was preaching in Psalm 34. Psalm 22 says this, David wrote, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and, and from my words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry out in the daytime, but you do not hear in the night season, and I am not silent. Now, those first words hopefully will ring a bell to you because Jesus actually quoted them 
as he hung on the cross to die for our sins. In his darkest hour, Jesus quoted Psalm 22, which came from David's pen. So that's verses 1 and 2, but Psalm 22 is not just two verses long, it continues. Here is the rest of Psalm 22. But you are holy, enthroned in the praise of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. There's an amazing pivot that happens between verses 2 and 3, that David, in the middle of his struggle, in the middle of this dark night of the soul, in the middle of his battle, David says to God, you are holy and you are enthroned. You're still sovereign. You're still king. Now, please don't miss what I'm about to say. If maybe you came to church and you find your mind going to your barbecue afterwards and what you have to pick up at like Kroger to grill, just come back here. Come back here. Do not miss. Key point. Key point. It is very easy to praise the Lord when everything is going great. But praising God when everything is falling apart, is very different. David here is praising God when his world's upside down. In the midst of uncertainty, disappointment, frustration, he praises God. That does not come naturally to us, if we're honest but there is strength when we do it. When we do that, when we praise God during the storms of life, not after they've passed, but during, we strengthen ourselves in the Lord. So what David did in Psalms 34 and Psalms 22, it's echoed by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament when he wrote to the Thessalonians, where he said, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will For you in Christ Jesus. Now, something I need to clarify in this verse, because sometimes we read it wrong. The Apostle Paul is saying, give thanks in all circumstances. He doesn't say, give thanks for all circumstances. Distinction there, it's very important. We do not need to like fake it and be thankful for tragedies when they happen. We don't need to be thankful. When bad things happen, but what he's saying is in the middle of those tragedies, in the middle of those bad things, in the middle of those storms of life, we can still give thanks in those circumstances. So the key thought is there is strength in praising and thanking God right in the middle of a storm. In other words, don't just thank God after the fact. Right in the middle, praise God. While it still hurts, while the future's still unknown, while the pain's still there, things aren't resolved, you're not sure how things are going to turn out, praise the Lord. And it's hard. But it's necessary. And when we do it, it strengthens us. And so with that, I, as I prayed about what to share, just to take you behind the curtain. I decided to talk about my dad for a little bit today. Uh, for those of you who maybe are newer to the church, you wouldn't have known, wouldn't know my dad. He was a super volunteer, key volunteer. He was known at the church as Grandpa Cop. People didn't know, I think, many of them at his funeral. His name was Dallas until they went to the funeral. They just called, everyone called him Grandpa Cop. My mom, Grandma Cop. This was known as Grandma Cop's church to any young child here It was great because she was in the nursery every Sunday, super volunteer. My dad was part of our camera crew. Uh, He was part of the teardown team when we were portable, Shelby Junior High days. Um, There was just super volunteers. And and in the year 2015, so nine years ago, out of the blue, my dad was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, stage four. I was in the room when he got the diagnosis with a doctor. And it's just like the oxygen leaves the room. He He said that way. They took some tests, pancreatic cancer, stage four. And so at the time, again, complete shock, the doctors gave him two years to live. And 
we did, when, when we found that out, we did what I preached on before. When in doubt, fire in all directions. In other words, do everything you can in the natural, do everything you can in the supernatural. So in the supernatural, we prayed for my dad a ton. We gathered around him on a Sunday. Alan took this picture that I didn't show today, but just like the, the prayer group gathered around my dad, like 40 people deep, just laying hands on him, anointing him with oil. Like just anything you can do in the supernatural, in the natural, my dad chose to do chemo and other, other treatments. But even though we did all of that, he didn't have two years to live. He was actually gone two months after the diagnosis. Two months. And that happened nine years ago this month, coming up to September uh, the 26th. And so this is what I consider my favorite picture. If you've been here, you've seen it before. It's a picture of Grandpa Cop and me at my mom and dad's house over in Clinton Township. Just on a whim, my mom snapped this picture. And I'm so thankful that she did because that's the last picture we have when my dad still looked like my dad before the cancer just destroyed him. And he like seemed to age like 10 years every day at the end. And so I'm super thankful for that picture. My dad was a great dad. He was a, he was a great man. I'm very thankful especially for the, just how we connected as father and son in, in the last 10 years of his life. We went from being like father and son to, to friends. And thankful that so many in the church who were part of the church back then knew my dad, knew my mom, grandpa and grandma cop, because they were volunteers, because they were part of the team. And so I still remember the day I went to see my dad during the last week of his life when we didn't know it was the last week of his life. And my mom was there. We're at Henry Ford on uh, 19 Mile by Hayes, having a conversation with the doctors and the doctors mention, man, he's doing really bad. And in the conversation, they mention he has two days. And I remember saying, no, you mean two years. And they said, no, we mean two days. And I kind of argue with them, wait a second, like two months ago, you said two years, and now you're saying two days? It was Thursday when we got that news. You're, you're saying he's to be gone by Saturday, like this Saturday. And so our world was in a tailspin, me and my mom. And unfortunately, the doctors were right that time. They were right. So it's the morning of September 26th, it was Saturday morning. And I had my phone with me at all times. And my phone rang at 1 o'clock in the morning. And when you have a loved one in the hospital and your phone rings at 1 o'clock in the morning, you know it's not good news. And so the phone rang, I answered it, it was the nurse. And the nurse said that my dad's body was actively shutting down, and if I wanted to see him before he died, I needed to get here quick. And so I hopped in my car, and really so I could be there for my mom. She was at the hospital, she never left. I saw him earlier that night, went home to go to bed. See you tomorrow, mom. See you tomorrow, Dad. Not knowing at 1 o'clock in the morning I'd be back at the hospital. So I, uh, back then I owned a red PT Cruiser, and a PT Cruiser is not exactly a Dodge Charger or a Viper. So when I say I got there as fast as I could, PT Cruiser fast. And it's okay to laugh. I know this is a heavy story. Inject some humor. It's okay. On my way there, um, as I'm driving by myself at 1 in the morning to Henry Ford, I got out my iPod. And just as a side note, this is um, back when we owned things like iPods, which in a strange way is like ancient, ancient technology already. Isn't that weird? Like back in the days of the dinosaurs, when we had iPods, before we used our phones for everything, right? And so, but I had my iPod, and I played an album on my iPod by Michael W. Smith. The album was Sovereign. And there were songs like You Won't Let Go, Heaven Come Down, and Miracle. So I get to Henry Ford Hospital in about 20 minutes, and about an hour later, it, it happened. My dad breathed his last breath. We were in the room when it happened. And for the next hour, my brother Doug, my older brother Doug, my mom, and I, we cried a ton with just in the room with my dad's 
body. He was gone. Praise God. But his body was still there. And it's if you've ever been there, it's just one of those moments where you're there and you're grieving and you're crying and you're having conversations with, you know, the hospital workers and you're like, I guess it's time to go. And you go. And it's just a weird feeling. And so Doug and I were talking to my mom. We're like, hey, you can't. She, she was living by herself at, at her house in Clinton Township. We're like, you can't be home alone. You, why don't you come and stay at our house? Doug lived up in Armada. So our house was closest. Why don't you come and we'll, we'll drive you, Mom. You're in no shape to drive. And, and my mom said, no, I'm, I'm actually good. And if Grandma Cop said she was good to drive, she's good to drive. <laughs> So she drove. She's like, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. And so I hopped in my PT cruiser, and my ma- mom hopped in her PT cruiser. We're, we were a Chrysler family. And so just to, like, chuckle a bit, just imagine at 3 a.m., this convoy of PT cruisers driving up the Van Dyke Expressway, uh, coming to her house. And so it's just me. I, I'm in my car. As soon as, as soon as I get in my car, in the Henry Ford parking lot, and I had a choice to make. Yeah, it's just me in the car. What am I going to do? Is it a time where I'm going to scream at God? Where I'm going to get mad at him? Was it a time where I was going to blame God, accuse God maybe? What, was it a moment where I was going to decide that healing prayer was a sham, that God is not a God of miracles? Would it be a time where I pounded the steering wheel in frustration and anger? Again, it was just me in the car, me and my little PT Cruiser, nobody else. What am I going to do? And, and it was one of those moments where I, I know I had free will, but at the same time, I didn't feel like I had a choice. I knew what I needed to do. I knew, maybe, maybe more accurately, I knew what God was inviting me to do. And so I did what I felt God invited me to do. I got out my iPod. And I started playing Michael W. Smith, the Sovereign album, picking up where I left off on my way to the hospital. Same album. And on my way back, driving home, I knew what I needed to do. I needed to praise God. I needed to thank God. I needed to declare things that I know are true, even though I didn't experience them as true. I needed to remind myself of things that are true that night. My dad just died like an hour earlier. I'm driving home, Michael W. Smith's Sovereign Album, and here is one of the songs that I play and I sung. I am not going to sing it to you today. I'm going to read the lyrics. You're welcome. I'm not going to sing. Here we go. So here, again, the song, Sovereign Over Us. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our mourning with a love that casts out fear. You are working in our waiting. You're sanctifying us. When beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You are with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. Here's the bridge. Even what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful You're working for our good. You're working for our good and for your glory. And so again, singing that song, playing that song, praising God, 3 o'clock in the morning, an hour or so removed from my dad breathing his last breath. Looking back, I'm so thankful I made that choice. Driving home, Praising God, right in the middle of a storm. I knew when I did that for a fact, it was victory in the spiritual battle that was raging. For what am I going to believe? Because even though my dad died, it does not change the fact 
that Jesus is the healer. Even though my dad was not healed on this side of heaven. See what's awesome, by the way? As I'm praising God and he's in heaven, he is healed. No more pancreatic cancer, no more pain, no more vomiting. But I was still grieving. I'm feeling it right now. <laughs> but even though my dad just died, it does not, it did not change the fact that God is good. Because even what the enemy means for evil, God turns it for our good. Even in the valley, God is faithful. He's always at work. And he's good. He's good. And so what I'm about to share right now is something I added to my sermon like at 4 a.m. today-ish. Woke up and had other stuff I needed. To, I had preached and that's on the cutting room floor, maybe for a different sermon. But I felt just this, this just the weight of God to share what I'm about to share. Um, it's something that I learned from, from Bill Johnson, Pastor Bill Johnson, um, from his book, Strengthen Yourself in the Lord. It helped, this book helped shape the, this series that we're in. And something that I read in the book was profound. It just, it, it wouldn't leave me. I woke up, it's like, okay, time, time to go back to work at 4 a.m. today. Here's, here's the aha moment. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Now, as I read that, it's easy to read right past. If you read like all chapter 13, uh, you can read right past. There's three words in there that are really easy to, to read right past, but they kind of, we should kind of stop and go, I don't understand what that means. It, it's the phrase, sacrifice of praise. That's an odd phrase. Those, those three words kind of don't, don't go together, or at least they don't feel like they should, right? Because, because typically, when we think of praising God, it costs us nothing. Like, it's easy to do, right? So, for example, when you get an answer to prayer, you say, praise God. Praise God. Answer to prayer. When the test results come back, negative. Praise the Lord, right? Praise God. When, when a mountain moves, praise God. When, when you get the job, Praise God. When the friendship that was broken is restored, praise God, right? When the healing happens, praise God. And when those things happen, like just praise breaks forth, you don't have to try. It's just natural. It happens, right? You're tracking. It's easy to praise God. When good things happen, there's no sacrifice, there's no cost when we praise God in those moments. So what's going on here with this concept of a sacrifice of praise from this verse in the book of Hebrews. To answer that question, I need to read another scripture to you. This is the Apostle John in the revelation of the future. Last book of the Bible, chapter 21 of the Revelation. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. Skip into verse three. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. And then here's the key. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So here, here's the deal. Here's how Hebrews connects with Revelation. When you praise God in the middle of your pain or mourning or crying, when you praise God in the middle of your confusion, your disappointment, your uncertainty, that's a sacrifice. That is a sacrifice of praise. It is not easy to do, but it is good to do. We need to do it. Now, something to think about, too. In heaven, right, I just read the picture of the promised future for those who believe in Jesus. 
Bible teaches in heaven there will be no more mourning or crying or pain. In heaven, there will be no emotions like worry or fear or, or disappointment or frustration, right? Those emotions will not be in heaven. So when you praise God in the middle of those feelings, when you feel those things, when you are experiencing those things, that is something that is only possible to do right now while you're still on earth. It is a way you can bless God now that you won't be able to bless him in heaven. See, you will not be able to praise God in the middle of your pain in heaven because there's no pain in heaven. You won't be able to praise God in the middle of crying or mourning in heaven because there's no crying or mourning in heaven. So when you do this, when you offer this sacrifice of praise on earth, you are giving God something you will not be able to give him in eternity. It is a sacrifice of praise. And that is a gift we can give to God. It's a way we can bless the Lord. And if we're able to do that, if we're able to praise God when the world and the devil take their best shots at us, you will get stronger. If you're able to praise God in the middle of the storm, you will strengthen yourself in the Lord. And so with that being said, I want to give you an action step, a way to live out this sermon. It's this question, what storm are you in right now and how can you thank God and praise him right in the middle of it? Now, the word storm probably should be in quotes there. It's not, it, it can be a big storm, maybe a small storm. For, for some of you, I know your stories. Uh, something massive just happened when it comes on like a one to 10 scale. What you just went through, or maybe what you're going through, maybe over the past year what you went through, it is a 10. It is a really bad thing. It is a hard thing. Maybe you're grieving. As I'm preaching, you're feeling those emotions all over again because whatever event, whatever that thing happened, turned your world, turned your life upside down. So for some of you, that storm is a monsoon. 10 out of, out of 10. Others of you, maybe it, it could be something smaller in scope. Maybe it's like a 5 on a 10 scale of like bad things, but it's still bothering you. It's still frustrating. There's still uncertainty. There's still worry. It's, it's not resolved yet. Or maybe for others of you, as I'm preaching, maybe something happened to you, and it's really, honestly, not, not that big of a deal. Like, maybe it's like a 1 or a 2 on a 10 scale, if, if you're honest, but you found yourself kind of having a pity party and feeling sorry for yourself. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands about that. Who's having a pity party right now? But it happens to us, right? We're human. Or, or maybe, honestly, if that's you and I'm preaching, you're like, you know what? I'm, it's, it's actually blue skies for me right now. But I have a friend. I wish they were here in the seat next to me because they're in a storm. And you have homework. You need to meet with them and share this with them. Maybe share this on, on the Internet when we post it. And have a conversation with them to be there for them. So again, no, no matter which of you, whichever, it's the 10 out of 10 monsoon, the 5 out of 10, maybe the 1 or 2 out of 10, or, or maybe the blue skies, how can you praise God and thank God in the middle of it? And again, what this means is it's not waiting till after the storm has passed. It's not waiting after the fact. It's praising God right in the middle of it. While it still hurts, while the pain is still there, while things are not resolved, while there's still unknowns, when you aren't sure how it's going to work out, and, and maybe even like in the case with my dad, when things didn't work out the way you prayed. And in the midst of that, a couple scriptures to hold on to, like lifelines. Romans 8, 28, the Apostle Paul says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We often read this wrong. This does not say God causes all things. 
But it says whatever comes your way, God can use it, and he will, for good. Joseph in the Old Testament. I could preach like a sermon on this. I'm just going to share one verse. What his brothers did to Joseph kind of echoed what David's men did to him. They betrayed him. They wanted him dead. Here's what Joseph said to his brothers. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Same verse in the message translation. He says, don't you see, you planned evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good. So what storm are you in right now, and how can you praise God and thank God right in the middle of it? Again, Psalm 34, verse 1, David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. David said, I'm going to bless God at all times, not just the good times, not just when everything is going great. When we do that, there's strength. When we do that, there's strength. Not easy. It's a sacrifice, a sacrifice of praise. Let me read Psalm 22 to you, those five verses, but I'm not going to interrupt verse 2 and 3. I'm going to read it continuously, just right after the other, just to understand or see and experience the shift. Where David says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry out in the daytime, but you do not hear, and in the night season, and I'm not silent. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. That's an amazing shift. It's a sacrifice of praise. In the middle of the storm, the struggle, this dark night, David says, God, you are holy. God, you can be trusted. Again, it's easy to praise the Lord when everything's going great, when it's blue skies. But David's praising God when everything's falling apart. It doesn't come naturally to us, but the scripture says, for those who are in Jesus, the, right, the old is gone, the new has come, we're new creations. Naturally supernatural. And there is strength when we do it. Strength when we give God a sacrifice of praise. And so my hope and prayer, first of all, preach to myself before I preach to you, is that we'd be a church that does what David did Praise God, thank him, right in the middle of our storm. When we do that, we will strengthen ourselves in the Lord. Amen. Let me pray. So God, thank you for this day. As we sang, thank you for the breath in our lungs. Thank you, God, that you are the great I am. And great are you, Lord. And so I thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity to preach this sermon for each person here. Bless them. Meet them. In this message, God, may they not just be hearers of it, but doers of it. May they give you a sacrifice of praise this week. Thank you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen.